Hi, I'm Grant Thomas, and my talk is entitled Thinking Inside the Boxes, the Importance of Comics and Graphic Novels in Art Education. Uh, this is based off of an article that uh, is being published in Visual Arts Research. It's a journal put out by the University of Illinois Press. Um, and um, just a little bit about myself. Um, I am a uh, elementary art teacher, and I use comic books quite frequently in my class. And I also have a little comic book club that I run with uh, my colleague, who's a first grade teacher. So he has the traditional classroom background, and I've got the visual arts background, and we kind of balance each other out. I also have many colleagues that um, use comic books in their classes, and they're traditional classroom teachers. Um, I'm also a comic book artist myself, and I have a comic book called uh, My Life in Records uh, that started as a webcomic, and then I put out little print versions from time to time. Uh, and uh, that's self-published, but I also have had some comics uh, published by Fantagraphics in an anthology of abstract comics, um, which was uh, edited by Andre Malatou. Uh, who's a good uh, uh, colleague and friend as well. Um, so uh, let's talk a little bit about um, my experience with teaching art um, and, and comic books. I think when I first started teaching, I had a lot of lessons that looked like this. This isn't particularly my lesson plan, but it looks like something I probably would have done. I did a lot of lessons about uh, color theory and design principles. Um, and frankly, I, you know, began teaching these things, and I got bored with them very quickly. And so I um, started starting a lot of my lessons with uh, a story, or had the students embed some kind of storytelling in their artwork. And I really became more interested in the outcomes, and I think the students were more engaged too. And as I entered into my masters, I. Um, really made that my emphasis about visual narratives um, and uh, all the ways that artists have told stories through pictures. Um, so I went to some of the theory of uh, storytelling and stories in our culture and um, I really liked the narrative paradigm. Uh, Walter Fisher had the, uh, came up with the narrative paradigm and coined the phrase homo narrens. Fisher believes that to be human is to be a storyteller. He theorizes that all communication is a form of narrative. Jerome Bruner theorizes that we organize our experiences and memories mainly in the form of narratives such as stories, myths, and explanations. Clark goes further and says we learn narratively, first by hearing stories and second by telling. And she writes, narrative and sense making and learning are all connected. So if Fisher's belief that people are storytelling creatures, if that's accurate, then we must nurture the storytelling in our students to help them discover not only their own humanity, but the humanity of others. Because when you read a narrative or see one in a movie or hear about one that's being told to you, you are actually having an encounter with that individual. Um, and so there's a lot of comic books just to bring it back to comics, that have been autobiographical. It's becoming more and more mainstream to do autobiographical comics. Um, and there's certainly um, Mouse is an example of a memoir. Uh, it's called a graphic novel, but it's actually a memoir. Um, and so these are uh, factual and truthful accounts um, in the form of narrative. Now, I don't think we just have to have people tell their own stories. I think we can uh, use uh, fiction also to understand uh, our own humanity and humanity of others. Um, for instance, uh, in Sean Tan's uh, graphic novel, The Arrival, he uses a speculative lens to look at the issues of human migration. There's a lot of um, visual allusions to Ellis Island immigration um, at the turn of the century, and um, I use this book a lot with my students to uh, try to look at issues that are currently going on in immigration 
and see some of the comparisons um, between what happens in the fictional story and, uh, and it's very surreal if you haven't read it it's a very surreal story um, and then also uh, you know some experiences with that we have read about or even hear about in our own classroom we have a lot of international students where I am from um, Tan says, more and more I see fantasy worlds as in the arrival, as a way of tapping into the real world, of trying to understand reality better through a speculative lens. A lot of times uh, fiction is thought of as an escape, but Sean Tan certainly thinks that fiction is a way that we can understand our reality. Now, comics have not always had such a respect in the classroom. Uh, and this really goes back to Friedrich Wertham in 1954. He published a book called uh, Seduction of the Innocent, and he talked about the content of comics being a problem, and he also talked about it as uh, contributing to illiteracy. So he thought that they were juvenile, they led to juvenile delinquency, and they contributed to illiteracy. He said that readers of comic books were bookworms without books. And he believed that when a child read a comic, they were just looking at the pictures and they did not engage with the text. And he thought that the text was more important, that the text and image were not integrated, but the text was actually more important than the image. So there's a huge backlash against comics. People would take them and burn them, uh, big community gatherings like this. And uh, I'll warn you some of the content here will be a little bit disturbing uh, but he had some good points about some of the content in comics um, he uh, there was no uh, regulations on what what students or children could and could not buy and some of it was quite graphic and violent now um, in looking at the content he often took that way too far and developed some theories about uh, people being able to look just for uh, an image if they knew where to look and uh, like in the, for instance this man's shoulder if you look really closely you can see a woman's pubic hair he thought that children could be corrupted by even images like that um, but as far as uh, literacy goes now um, teachers are using this as uh, kind of a scaffold towards reading prose um, they uh, are considered worthwhile in a classroom, and there's a lot of scholarship that was going on about, you know, in the last 15 years that links comics to helping students learn to read traditional prose, and um, the thinking is that they're very uh, motivational, you know, a student can find a popular character like Spider-Man or Garfield and really latch onto that, and if they have an aversion to reading something that seems more boring, then eventually that kind of wears off as they realize it's not so bad. Um, so, uh, unfortunately, uh, even though uh, teachers are bringing comics into the mainstream, uh, Jacobs points out that they're still using the theory that Wortham had of the text being more important than the image, and so they're ironically kind of aligning themselves with his ideas um, because they're thinking of comics as... Um, you know, maybe a gateway drug to reading real prose. You know, I had a student actually come up to me a few weeks ago and said, oh, I used to read graphic novels last year, and now I read books with no pictures. And she said that long after I made that strip on the last slide. Um, but to relegate comics to this, um, I don't want to, to, to put that down and say that we should not use comics to motivate students to read traditional prose. I think reading traditional prose is important and mo finding motivation to, for students is important too, but if we just use comics for that, um, if we just relegate them to that, it's going to use only a fraction of their potential. And really comics are the sum uh, that's greater than their parts. Um, they're not just you know illustrated captions or um, things like that. Um, they're, they're something even bigger than that. Um, so let's look at it kind of a multimodal view um, of comics in uh, because comics are considered a hybrid text even if you look at a traditional newspaper you will see um, a text maps charts graphs photographs all have to be interpreted in diff through different modes um, the, the 
the, uh, the images with the colors, the charts, the body language of people in photographs, all need to be interpreted. And you also have to have an understanding of the hierarchy of information. Is this um, headline more important than this advertisement? So forth. Now, in 96, the New London Group created this chart. Um, I kind of prettied it up a little bit. And they um, identified six uh, modes of meaning. And then um, there's five that are called the linguistic, visual, gesture, spatial, and audio modes. And then the sixth one is a multimodal element that negotiates the interconnectedness between the five modes. So if we were just to take just two of these, let's take the linguistic mode and the visual mode and combine them to a multimodal situation. We could take these images here that have the same text, but the font is rendered in two different ways. And you can see you're being invited to two different parties. Um, and I don't know which party you'd rather be at, um, or what's even on the menu. Um, and so that's just an example of you know what we do if we combine two modes. But comics often will engage many modes at the same time. Sometimes all of them. Obviously, the audio mode they only would um, allude to um, visually. But um, if we look at this panel from Asterius Polyp, you can see that the um, text is even written in different handwriting to kind of imply different sounds coming from different voices. Um, the speech balloons in every character in this book have different shapes. The uh, man with the box shaped speech balloon, he's a uh, very professorial and, um, and he's an architect so he's a very formal way of talking. Um, we can see that his body language is turning away from the bum, that's the gestural mode. There's the visual mode and with the colors to suggest, you know, the, the lighting on the bus that they're on. And this is just one panel with tons of information packed into it. Um, so not all comics use this at all times, but it kind of shows you the potential of what kind of information could be in comics that's more than just the text and more than even just the visual mode. Um, so I've talked about traditional literacy. I've talked about the changes in views on literacy with multimodal education. I want to talk a little bit about art education. And uh, I turn to Olivia Goody, who um, writes a lot about what do art programs need to look like in the 21st century. Um, and she says that an important issue to address in contemporary art is the interaction of text and image. That's in a lot of contemporary art. And uh, comics uses that obviously quite frequently. Here we have, this is from uh, Scott McCloud's Understanding Comics, and we have a text and image that don't quite line up in their meaning, so we actually have another layer of meaning on top of that. She also says juxtaposition is an important issue in contemporary art, and that is pretty much how comics create their sense of time, by just having a sequence of images put in order. Alright, so we talked a lot about theory Let's talk about some practical implications for art teachers. Um, if you're not an art teacher, just uh, bear with me. I did write this article for other art teachers. Um, but some practical implica implications of all these theories are kind of as follows. Um, when I was learning to be an artist, I did lots of uh, still life drawings and uh, three-point perspective, two-point perspective. I drew the model in the life drawing class. But I was rarely given insight as to how to apply these newly acquired skills to make meaningful works of art. So it was like going to batting practice every day and um, never playing a single game or even knowing how to do that if I had gone out to play a game. So on the other hand, comics offer a venue for students to display their abilities to efficiently and effectively use a repertoire of knowledge and skill to negotiate a complex and multi-stage task. Each mode of meaning offers a chance to build art making skills in the context of visual stories. All right, so let's go through some of the modes and see how we could tweak them for comics. Uh, we could take your traditional life drawing, which would be your visual mode, and even your gestural, and um, make it not only a way to make the figure look believable, but also to flesh out characters through body language, fashion, and proximity. We could take perspective drawing exercises and use that as a chance to build worlds for characters to inhabit. 
Portraiture would become a way to have students act through drawing to convey facial expressions that reveal emotions, reactions, and personality. Now we can take some of these traditional skills like that and then selectively ignore them or expressionistically exaggerate them to further explore human aspiration, fears, and fantasies. Expressively drawn figures um, and exaggerated figures can symbolically communicate meaning beyond your typical body language. Uh, the spatial mode, you could use an economic or a minimalist approach to spaciousness for symbolic purposes, or an implied sense of space can be used to heighten excitement. Um, comics often use magic realism, and this is really something that's not quite as believable in film or prose. Um, this panel in here is from Eclectic, and it's supposed to represent the epilepsy that his brother is struggling with. And in, in Art Spiegelman's Mouse, the Jews are mice and the cats are the Nazis. Um, and I really can't imagine this working in film. It really just only works as a drawn image where it's just accepted that that's the way things are. And the metaphor works that way because we're not having to always be told it like you would be in a novel or, or have it rendered beautifully in computer graphics like you would in a film. Um, this is a Japanese-influenced comic, influenced a lot by Japanese romance comics, but it uses a montage of images to exhibit internal emotions. Um, so we need to give students time to tell their stories, whether these are autobiographical events or through the speculative lens of fiction. And as an art teacher, I'm always trying to learn some of the tricks of the trade of the literacy teachers and the traditional classroom teachers. Um, and even if they don't end up making comics or films or anything like that, we need to be able to teach them this stuff because they will be engaging with hybrid texts and it will help them understand the future hybrid texts that they're going to encounter out of class because a lot of our information is coming in through these texts these days. Um, so educators' belief has changed a lot over the last century about comics. Um, they were once considered bad for kids, and now they're considered good and legitimate uh, to use in traditional uh, reading and writing. Um, but as hybrid texts become more prominent, um, comics will be a rewarding way to teach students to navigate these texts, and making comics will also be an occasion to give voice to the, our students, and ha they'll have their own multimodal stories to share with the world.